Great to have you with us. Last time you were with us, it was in the lead up to the November 3 election. You were opening your arena. Give us a sense of how that worked and what you learned from that experience that you're applying this time. Well, uh, good to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Um, Listen, I think what we learned is that it's absolutely possible to have folks come to vote and be in and out of a safe and efficient voting environment in less than 20 minutes and do it safely and properly. And this is, uh, as we tried to describe earlier, and as we uh, certainly have reaffirmed through action, uh, a public-private partnership where an arena can step up, partner with the local authorities, and actually provide a safe and attractive voting location, uh, I think Atlanta should be extremely proud of itself and is now a model of voting in this country rather than, shall we say, a while ago where people didn't look at it quite that way. Tony, do you have any sense at this point whether it's affecting turnout? Because it struck me, as I understand it, you don't have to go, you don't have to be in a particular precinct to be able to go to the Hawks Arena to in order to vote. You, if you're from Georgia, from the entire area, you could vote. Are you getting a bigger turnout, you think, because it's just easier to do it? Well, I think at our arena, I think they call it a super polling location. Anywhere in Fulton County, you could, and if you are from anywhere in Fulton County, you could come vote at the arena. And I might add, uh, in this go-round, Our friends at the Atlanta Falcons, uh, after the first week, are going to take on the next two weeks of opening Mercedes-Benz Stadium. So let's just say the fairway is widening uh, to those members of the private sector in Atlanta that are really helping making voting more accessible, easier, more efficient, et cetera. So uh, the the answer to your question of whether it's increasing turnout, uh, I don't really know. I, I think people think that it is easier to vote, more folks are coming to vote. Uh, obviously, there's a whole lot of politics out there, but uh, our our objective was really to make voting easier. And whether you're Republican or Democrat, we wanted to make voting easier in Atlanta, in the state of Georgia. I, I think we kind of helped to do that, and we're proud of it. Uh, the, the turnout on November 3rd was extraordinary, the highest, as I understand it, since 1900 in this country as a proportion. Uh, are people getting tired in Georgia of elections? Do you have any sense that people are not as likely to turn out this time to vote for whichever candidate? Listen, uh, I don't think I'd be the first to say that uh, most of America has uh, both COVID fatigue and voting fatigue and politics fatigue. Uh, let, let's admit that. But uh, listen, runoffs don't generally receive as much attention in Georgia or anywhere else. But I think this runoff is so uh, uh, important nationally, as I think, uh, as a statement of the obvious, uh, I think there is going to be pretty impressive turnout. Uh, There were long lines uh, before we opened the doors this morning. So uh, I do expect there to be a meaningful turnout. And I think people do know uh, that actually uh, control of the Senate seems to be at stake. Uh, so, Tony, let's put this in a broader context of the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, and and yeah, Atlanta Hawks is a citizen of the community in Atlanta because you're doing this voting thing. not the only thing that you're doing down there at all. As I understand, you just had a refinancing of your facility, and you specifically went to a syndicate of black bank- banks. Tell us about that. Well, l- listen, at the Atlanta Hawks, like every NBA franchise, <laughs> we're, we're trying to win games. We're trying to run a good business. And, and, and our view, at least, is we do think we could be a positive force in the community Uh, We thought opening our arena to voting was just one uh, action we could take that would help uh, be a good community asset, if you will. Um, Listen, we've tried to help uh, public education in K-12 schools throughout Metro Atlanta. We've built uh, park and rec centers uh, around Metro Atlanta. We are certainly actively involved in helping Black economic empowerment, uh, refinancing our bank facility uh, with a consortia of Black banks. What was actually good business, uh, we thought, good business dealing with good people. Uh, we do think it highlights the importance, the importance of having successful Black banks, Black-owned banks, and Black-run banks in this country. We do think access to capital is a critical component of improving economic empowerment for the African-American community. So, uh, yes, it's part of what we call good business, uh, dealing with good people. So we're proud of it. And uh, actually, we got a very attractive refinancing done, and we couldn't be more proud. A, a lot of us are watching Capitol Hill right now and the need for fiscal stimulus, the back and forth over that, even as there are people across the country, and I'm sure in Atlanta, 
who are really hurting, really hurting. And as you know so well, Tony, the black communities across the country have been disproportionately hit by COVID. Give us a sense in Atlanta of what is particularly needed right now. I think Atlanta is a microcosm of the country. It's, a, it's actually a booming economic area that has massive uh, inequality. Uh, I would say that Atlanta, like many uh, really uh, strong economic areas in America, but have had uh, really uh, a tough going with certain types of businesses from COVID. Of course, uh, hospitality-related hotels, restaurants, uh, arenas, uh, stadiums, businesses that require people to come to them. Uh, there's a whole lot of folks in this country uh, with real economic strain, as we know, and uh, I can't quite, uh, you know, you had several people on uh, speaking about uh, the stimulus requirements. It doesn't seem as complicated to me as it does to many. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we probably have 160 million jobs in this country and 40 million of those have been really exposed to COVID. That's 40 million families under duress. Uh, those families have to get uh, stimulus checks. And I would argue those checks uh, should be going uh, this week and it doesn't seem as complicated to me. Uh, you know, if you take $3,000 checks for 40 million families on a monthly basis, we, we see light. We need six months of $120 billion a month. That's a $700, $750 billion stimulus package day one. There's a whole lot of other steps that should come after or in conjunction. But that, that doesn't seem controversial. It seems a statement of the obvious. And I, I just can't figure out why that's not moving forward, irrespective of politics. And finally, Tony, let's turn back to basketball and the NBA. You're going to start the season up next week, as I understand it. It's going to be very different from that bubble down in Orlando at the Disney facility. What are your concerns? What have you learned from the experience last time, or that matter from what the NFL is going through right now? Uh, I, I don't know if I'd call them concerns. I, I would rather say acknowledgments, which is it's really complicated to run uh, the NBA right now in this time of COVID, just like it is the NFL, just like it was the – Major League Baseball, just like it was in National Hockey League. Uh, so running professional sports uh, is so important in today's world. I truly believe the ability to watch uh, and enjoy professional sports for folks that really are uh, forced to be shut in, I think is an extremely valuable thing for us to have as Americans. On the other hand, uh, listen, we want to keep all of our players and all of our staff and all of our employees safe. So we're trying to be incredibly cautious. Uh, many of the folks that have read through the NBA rules and regulations uh, might say that uh, many of the rules are exhaustive to, 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 uh, to really follow, and uh, I would be one of those. But, but I also understand how complicated it is to make everyone feel that we're doing everything possible to put on high-quality basketball in a safe environment. It's just difficult to do. And I, I actually congratulate, even though this is the party line, I congratulate Adam Silver and the entire staff of the NBA League office making all 30 teams abide by really exhaustive rules and regulations so the players and all of our employees feel that we're doing the best possible. Yeah, I, I, I doubt that anybody thinks that Adam Silver for the NBA or Roger Goodell for the NFL isn't doing their very, very best. And they do have, as you say, exhaustive rules and requirements. We had Daryl Green, you know, the, the all-star cornerback for the Washington Redskins on last week. And he said the only problem with that in the NFL is, is you actually have people involved. It's also awful hard to get your players to all comply with that, particularly when they're outside the arena. Is that a concern for you? Of course. It's, it, I can't believe I'm supporting Daryl Green. You know, as an old time, I grew up as a Giants fan. What a cornerback. <laughs> but away from that, uh, I'm just going to say that uh, it's, it's, of course, you know, players, employees are going home. We don't have the ability to create a bubble as we did in Orlando. So, of course, the level of risk is different. But listen, we're doing everything we can. We're having daily testing. We're having remarkable amounts of caution in the arena relative to who could come within 30 feet of players. We're uh, separating uh, players from, uh, certainly from fans and employees. We're doing everything imaginable, but exactly as you're suggesting, this is not going to be 100% successful. We know that, but we are doing everything imaginable, and we are acknowledging that like most Americans, you have to go to work, you have to do your best, and you have to be smart. And I think that's what we're trying to do in the NBA.